Hello, and welcome to another episode of We Live to Build podcast. Today's episode is special. My guest was supposed to be Aaron Shu, the CEO and co founder of Blurp.com. What ended up happening was he started asking me questions, and it became this cycle, and eventually I became the guest. So I hope you enjoy this interesting episode where I talk about psychology and bias and how to hire the right people, how to deal with weakness, and a lot of other really interesting topics. So, without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one. So let's get started now. Thank you, Aaron, for joining us. I know it's really early for you in the morning. I think it's about 7.30 a.m. Is that right? It is 7.30 a.m., but I will do this for you, Sean. Well, I appreciate it, Aaron. It's it's uh, really good to have you. So let's get right into it. The first question I'm really interested to know is, when did you realize that sound was such an important thing for you? And what was your process for learning to harness sound? Started out in college where we really started to see this movement for sound as in more and more people were listening to music. The digital movement was really strong. And this idea that how we really communicated was using our voice and seeing how powerful for us to share ideas through podcasts, to really take emotion from music while in college was really what got me super interested in it. And then stepping it back, I used to be really into filmmaking and this idea that you're able to create new scenes by dragging in sound effects. And these moments that you're able to just forge together with sound was very powerful to me. And I love that power that sound had to bring to these moments. And I think taking that passion and seeing how we could apply it to real life was really what got me excited about sound and the whole platform. Okay, do you wanna go a little bit deeper into that? What kind of films did you make? You know, they weren't any like cool films. It was more of those like funny things that you'd like post on YouTube. We never got any big. We got like a couple thousand subscribers. I started several YouTube channels over the years and the highest subscriber count I ever had was eight. Maybe my problem was I didn't have any sound effects in my videos. Maybe it was. It, it was astounding to me to like see how much power these sounds could bring. And it, it's not that sound is the content you want to focus on, which really got us more excited about sound, how like you can, you know, go on a drive and still be listening to a podcast, but fully focus on the road, right? It's this idea that sounds there to aid the experience, to bring in and enhance what's already there, which is really the exciting part of what we see with Blurp. If you had to pick, what is your most favorite sound in the entire universe? A famous actor, Shia LaBeouf, I don't know if you remember him. He says, just do it. I thought it was astounding how he was able to resonate his voice across millions by just a simple clip. And yeah, to me, like that's my favorite favorite sound today. If I had to pick, I'd probably say my most favorite sound in the entire world is the voice of Morgan Freeman. What qualities of that voice do you feel like make it so impactful, so resonating to us? I think it's a very deep sound. It's, it's a low sound. It's powerful. It's slow and methodical. And it's funny because the original concept I had for sidekick was this artificially intelligent system that could communicate with you. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie her. Oh yeah. The one with the operating system, right? With Joaquin Phoenix. And I thought, what if we could build something like that? But the difference between, you know, Google's assistant and Siri and Cortana and Alexa 
is that these big companies have told you what its name is. But with Sidekick, you could name your assistant. And in doing so, you would be able to develop a plausibly emotional relationship with it. Emotional in the sense that you bond with it because like a dog or a cat or a child, you've given it a name. And that instantly builds a psychological connection, whether you are willing to admit it or not. And I thought there's some uh, artificial intelligence models that do voice capture. And I think it was Baidu in China that perfected the system. You could upload about 30 seconds worth of sound and it can then synthesize the rest of the uh, voice. So you could essentially take a clip, uh, Morgan Freeman speaking, upload it into Baidu, and then you could create this system that essentially could use Morgan Freeman's voice and say anything you wanted it to say. And I thought it would be amazing if I built Sidekick and my AI was named Morgan and his voice was that of Morgan Freeman's. So is your vision of Sidekick, it being able to do everything an assistant would be able to do one day through the AI? That was part of the original vision. I didn't realize early on how hard it is to do a lot of software things. I've gained a very deep appreciation for just how hard it is now. And that's why you go, oh, why did it take them years to build that? Oh, okay, yeah. After several years of building something, I understand. I had an idea to build an artificially intelligent OS. Like literally, the, the artificial intelligence builds itself a home. And every part of the operating system is, is just bathed in it. And I think Microsoft kind of wanted to go there with Cortana, but the way that they did it just made everyone angry. It's kind of like the Microsoft Word little the clippy guy, paperclip guy. You remember that? You ever you ever see that little guy? Did that ever just make you angry? You turn on the app and this freaking thing jumps out of nowhere and goes, "Hey, how can I help you?" Sometimes things are hated aren't that bad because we remember it. I agree with you. It wasn't useful, but maybe they could have made it useful, and that would have been more powerful too. But how have you taken those experiences, like what you've learned from the past? to build what you are building today. So with my background in psychology, I learned a lot about uh, humans and social behavior. That was my, my personal focus, as well as like childhood development into adulthood and the way the brain forms over the years. And it's a very wide industry, psychology, or a very wide field. There's a lot of different uh, nuanced areas you can focus on, but they all kind of tie back to each other at one point. And so I try to use psychology to understand the competitors and the users and see where are the competitors failing in a way that I think they're failing and that what the users could potentially want, even if they may not know how to express it. And it is kind of what I find when I talk to people because the main complaint with Slack is, oh, it's disorganized. But they don't really know how to explain how it's disorganized until I start saying, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Like, does that sound like your problem? And it's unfortunate because you're kind of leading them. And in a way, they want to be led, but you don't want to lead them because then you're introducing your own bias, which is a huge problem in psychology, you know, inserting your own bias. And that's why there's a lot of double blind studies done because if the experimenter doesn't know who is you know, the experiment or the control, then it's impossible for them to impart their bias on the experiment, therefore uh, allowing them to be more satisfied with the results and knowing that what happened was legitimate and not because of any sort of external influence. I try to grab as much information as I can and use it to make decisions But when it comes to mathematics and sort of hard data, I leave that to my partner, Mark, my COO, uh, because I'm a language person. I'm a people person. I'm not really a numbers person. I mean, I can do a good bit of math in my head, but he's the one that backs up my ideas or tells me I'm wrong based on numbers. And that's really important to have someone that grounds you and keeps you focused. You always need someone like that to keep you grounded and keep you in check. And I love your talk about biases, just especially when building Blurp. We always, we, because we really do believe we're building in a category defining market. 
as in this audio space that's growing. Yes, we're a part of it, but there's parts of it that we believe that it's a brand new market and we can't exactly predict how big it is going to go because what we're doing is, you know, completely different. You can point to Giphy, you can point to Pinterest and you can point to other content companies and see what they're doing and say, oh yeah, like maybe like it's part of the content ad market. But this idea of like one day being able to help people monetize their voice is completely new for us. And we think it's interesting to like talk about how does our bias affect how much we drive this market because we're trying to carve it out as well as how much are we listening to the market and seeing where people pull, which is why we really focus on gaming, streaming, and Twitch, because that's really where we've seen the creators have the most pain for sharing sound and really focusing on that. But how we decide to monetize and carve out the market, it's definitely a lot of leading because some people don't know what they want. So hearing your experiences of just psychology and how you built around that is very cool. It's cool to connect experiences like that. I would also wonder, like, in psychology, how did that lead to running a startup? I was never actually interested in business when I was in university. My father is a dentist, so I grew up around, you know, a parent owning a company. He was great as a dentist, but he wasn't great as a business person. And that led back to university education was so focused on teaching people the career and not how to build a business around the career that it was hard for a lot of them to succeed in the business side unless they were naturally talented in it. So despite that, and despite my experience, you know, working for him in high school and in college and, um, you know, growing up in his office, meeting his patients and spending time with his employees and learning all about his industry, which was fan- uh, fantastic and, you know, fascinating. I loved the experience completely. But he never taught me about business other than to not do what he did. Not like he was a bad person. I mean, he, he's still alive. Not like he's a bad person because he was too busy being a dentist. He didn't have the time to be an operator. And this is a big problem actually for a lot of people because let's say you're a baker, right? You love baking. You start a bakery, you are baking goods every day, but in order for you to grow and have a second bakery or a third or a 10th or a 100th, or franchise, you need to standardize your processes, hire someone to do it, and then spend your time doing the marketing and sales. Now, my brother was uh, majoring in finance. So he was always the, I've got a business idea and you know I've got a list of hundreds of ideas. He was the one that kind of got me thinking about that, but I still wasn't terribly interested. So when I went to China, I went to go to be a teacher and to teach myself Mandarin. While I was there in the early years when I was 22, I watched very carefully because my background in psychology, I was observing the culture as I was learning the language. And I noticed that they did a lot of things in business very differently to what I was assuming Americans would do. And I started to think about how if I were to run their business, if I made one small change or, or several small changes, I could you know, increase their profit or increase their revenue. This was, I was like 22, 23. It just random ideas starting co- to come to me. When I was 26, I was fired from my job. I talk about it in episode two of this podcast, as well as the about page, my backstory, um, in case you or anyone else listening is interested in, to hear more about that. But he fired me. And that was the point where I said, okay, I'm never going to allow anyone to control my financial future. And that's when I started my first company a few months after, because I needed some time to to heal from my accident. That was really the start of the journey. I think I had the curiosity, knowing psychology gave me the ammunition to observe and being fired was the catalyst for starting my first company. That's pretty wild. How does that observation like drive you to learn so much about the things around you and want you to chase something bigger than yourself? Have you ever heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? I have, and I would love an education on it, though. (laughs) I don't want to go too detailed into it, but there's five levels. Some people say there's six. I'm going to stick with the five. The goal with Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs is to reach this kind of uh, psychological enlightenment. There's no real spirituality or or religious aspects linked to it, like you would have uh, nirvana from uh, Buddhism. And... The goal with Maslow's hierarchy of needs is to understand the foundation of your needs. And once you can satisfy those needs, you can then focus on the next level of your needs. 
the very base foundation is you need a place to eat, sleep, and, you know, basically shelter. If you have shelter, then you can start focusing on, you know, do you have clothes? Do you have money? You know, do you have some sort of job? You know, can you take care of yourself? And so if you start there, there's a lot of people that are homeless. Those people can't really think about other people if they're struggling to survive every day. If you think about people on the next level, you've got shelter, but you're poor. Well, you can't think about other people because you're trying to feed yourself every day and keep, make sure that you can continue to stay alive in that shelter. The next level is where people are talking about friendship, sex, these kinds of desires. If you have a place to live, to eat, drink, sleep, you know, someone to have sex with, someone that kind of accepts you and all of this, then you can start to think about getting towards enlightenment. So many of the people you probably know are sitting at the third level. They're comfortable. Maybe if you take a step back and you look at their life, they may not be happy, but they're living. They have what they need. When you get to the fourth level, it's more about starting to think about yourself from outside of your point of view. It's more about being self-aware and looking at the things around you. And I think meditation is probably one of the very few ways that allows you to go from level three to level four. Because with meditation allows you to step outside of yourself and observe your thoughts and train yourself to accept those thoughts without allowing them to affect your emotions. And I think that's an extremely important thing because a lot of people I talk to say, hey, I don't want to learn meditation because I'm afraid of being alone with my thoughts. And I go, but that's that's the wrong mindset. You should be thinking about how you can become friends with your thoughts because your thoughts either control you or you live with them. Being aware of your thoughts makes you become aware of your surroundings, aware of your environment, aware of your needs. And when you can do that, then you can start to think about the needs of other people, right? If you don't understand yourself, how the hell can you understand other people? And these are things that are not taught in school. They're, you, you know, nobody teaches you these things. Your parents don't teach you these things. Schools don't teach you these things. And if, you, if they do, then you are very blessed. My father insisted on teaching me meditation when I was 18. It was something that he used and meditation was a great way for him to relieve stress. So he insisted on me learning and I think that really helped me because by the time I got to China, I had already been meditating for five years. Wow. So I had a chance to really use psychology and meditation together to get deep into my own psyche and understand who I am and what I want and, and then traveling outside of the US gave me experiences to compare my experience in the US to other parts of the world and the needs of other people and how they differ based on their language and their culture. And then living amongst another culture like China, which is so vastly different than my own experience in the US, allowed me to blossom into this entirely different human being I didn't know was possible. You know, getting into the education and into the business and these different industries just really gave me tremendous experience. I should start meditating. I, I am curious, what was one of the most surprising things you discovered about yourself through that process? It's not like something triggers in you and you go, oh, I've learned that thing about me. You're constantly learning things about yourself as you get older. Part of meditation taught me that I was judging people. I was sometimes hurtful in the way I spoke to people without realizing I was doing those things. Meditation taught me to be calmer, more patient, more understanding, more generous of my time and my energy and my money. It taught me that I am not the center of the universe and I don't matter. Life doesn't have a purpose. However, because we have life, we have the choice, we have the freedom to decide how we're going to spend that time. And because of my accident, I realized that our time is very brief. And so we should be smart with how we use it. And building a business, despite taking years of your life, if you do it well, will give you the money so you can buy the freedom, you can buy the time so that you can live the rest of your life the way you want it to be. You talked about starting a tech company wasn't like you didn't realize how hard it was. And that's sort of the theme of what I usually tell people is, you know, I didn't know how hard it was going to be getting into it and how long it really takes to build, you know, a good software and the long process it takes and everything you need to know. And I'm curious what your thoughts were at the beginning 
how it evolved and what made you realize, oh, like this is a lot. And how did you not stop? Like what kept you going? I was under the belief that I could do anything I wanted to. Mm. It was just a matter of time, energy, money, and learning. Because I started in the blockchain space. So I, I did a lot of different services in that space. And the last thing that I hadn't done was start a company in the space. Obviously, later I pivoted and I got rid of the blockchain. So that's a different story. But I knew it was hard when I didn't know anything about project management. I didn't know anything about tech development. I didn't know anything about softwares or databases or cloud versus edge versus, you know, all of these other server lists and, and everything like that. I grew up with computers, so I understand how networking between computers works. I understand how the hardware works and the different pieces of hardware. And that was really interesting for me as a kid. I've always loved human language, but I never liked computer languages. And running a tech company is hard because you have to learn what you don't know. And then you have to learn how to learn it. If you hire the wrong people, you're going to get the wrong information, which I did. I wasted six months with the, the, a back-end developer. I wasted several months with several front-end developers. I've been through it. Um, you know, we, we picked the wrong back-end uh, database structures. We made all kinds of mistakes. And what kept me going was that I put my own money into it. You can't just stop. When you put that kind of money into a business, you can't just go, ah, this sucks, I'm gonna just stop. You have to go, I need to see this through because success is the only option. I don't know what success looks like, but I'll know it when I feel it. How do you find people you can trust? And how do you make those mistakes and learn from it in a less costly way? So it's interesting you asked that. I released an episode number four, turning a weakness into a strength, where I talk about how to know what a weakness is and what two paths you can take, specifically in this regard. So what I talked about was, in a nutshell, if you're not good at something, you either need to find someone who knows what they're talking about and they can guide you, or you need to learn at least the basic level of that thing and then hire someone who you know can do it because you have at least as much knowledge as you need to know that they're not lying to you about what they're doing. I'm of the belief that you should always try to do it yourself first because if you're going to build a big business, like the business I'm trying to build could potentially have a thousand employees. I don't know. I need to be able to understand the basic positions that I'm going to be hiring for. For example, social media, marketing, sales, customer service, tech, project management. I need to know all of these things and more because if I'm going to develop standard operating processes along with my COO, if I'm going to develop standards for hiring, which involve coding tests or sales tests or marketing tests, these kinds of hard skills tests, I need to know what their job expectations are. And the only way I can understand what their expectations are is if I do their job, right? So I was talking to another guest. His name is Moni. He'll be coming out in the next few weeks. He said when he first started his cleaning business, he was going to people's houses and cleaning, getting on his hands and knees and cleaning their floors because he needed to learn how to develop a routine for cleaning so he knew what his uh, customers would expect of him. With that in mind, I learned how to be a project manager. I learned how to talk about the front end and the back end and to research different database structures and I learned how to have these kinds of conversations with the tech team because I'm the project manager. I'm the CTO. I have no choice. I have to. I don't have a technical co-founder and I'm not a quote unquote technical founder. The only way that I can convince investors that what I'm doing is good is if I know what the hell I'm talking about. So I taught myself. It was hard. I wasted a lot of money and a lot of time making the wrong decisions and hiring the wrong people, but I learned and now I don't make those mistakes anymore. And guess what? Those investors didn't have to pay for it because I used my own money. So now I can go to them and say, I have two and a half years of experience running this company from the ground up. I understand the back end, the front end, the UI, UX. I can tell you what features we have down to every little tiny detail. I can explain how everything works. And I think that that mindset 
is really important for success. Totally agree with that. I mean, your story just embodies so much of, you know, that growth mindset. And it's inspiring because you you really show us that you don't really need to know everything to jump into something. And I, I think a lot of people who are on the fence just trying to think of if they want to do or not, it's cool to see someone like you who literally didn't know anything about tech, was able to jump in it and figure it out and, you know, take that risk. I, I mean, would you recommend it again <laughs> now that you're in the middle of it and just driving forward or? I think everyone's different. I think some people are naturally going to succeed because they'll do whatever they can to figure out what to do. Some people won't succeed no matter what they do. Some people have the potential to succeed. And one of the reasons why I'm building this podcast in this community is because I think I can help people to learn what not to do and what to do so that they can maximize their energy and their effort. So that's the end of this amazing episode. We had to cut it short for time reasons, but I hope you enjoyed the questions that Aaron asked me, and we're definitely going to have him on another time where he'll be answering the questions that I ask. So remember, entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. Take care of yourself every day, and stay tuned to our next episode coming soon.